We're going to read uh, Luke 1, 26 to 38. It's the birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. You can sit. Be seated. Thank you, Scott. There are some fantastic helps for children at the back of the church this morning. If you don't have them, you're welcome to go get them or pick them up afterwards as well. Thanks, Helen, for that. And thanks, others for that labor. Let's just pray. Oh, Lord, would you do something to our hearts through the Bible by your Holy Spirit? Lord, I consume myself with trivial things. I can think all day about things that are not worthy of a moment's thought. And I can think for just a moment of things that are worthy of hours of thought and worship. Lord, would you please, by your Holy Spirit, work some miracles in hearts today. Miracles, Lord. Miracles of faith and amazement and overwhelming us with truth such that we will get to the place where we can say with Mary, I am the servant of the Lord. Do what you want with my life. Bring us there this morning, please, as we prepare to take communion, Lord. Lord, thank you for Christmas. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all who have helped this morning. And Chad, if you're watching us, we love you. You're amazing. Thanks for your ministry week by week. And those of you out in TV land, we welcome you. We're glad you're watching us this morning. If if you receive the miracle of the incarnation, God becoming a man in Jesus, the grand miracle of Christianity, if you receive that as true, then every other miracle in the Bible falls into place and you have no trouble with them. Jesus walking on water, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, turning wine, water to wine, all the wondrous miracles of Christ are... 100% plausible if you receive the grand miracle, which is that God became a man through the Virgin Mary and these glorious truths at Christmas are the profound truths of the saving story of God. Remember we said last week that God reveals salvation to us through stories, true stories, not just ideas. He, he could have just downloaded some, here's 10 facts, believe these and you go to heaven. That's not how God has done it. He's done it through stories, wonderful, true stories. And now we're culminating the salvation story of history with the birth 
of Jesus Christ. I pray that you take Christmas for all that it's worth in a godly and holy way. God's salvation story moves from the hill country of Judea. Remember Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zechariah's name, God remembers. Elizabeth's name, his oath, the promise of the coming of John, who would become John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, preparing Israel for the Messiah to come so that people in 2021 in Overland Park, Kansas, would understand the love of God the redemptive work of God. God's salvation moves from Zechariah and Elizabeth in the hill country of Judea to a town in Galilee named Nazareth to a young girl. She would have been somewhere between the ages of 12 and 16. Mary. Those were the ages of betrothal in Israel. A young girl named Mary. There is absolutely nothing in this story that would have fit into the contemporary Jewish mind. Galilee was waste country. Nazareth was nowhere. If you were inventing a story to amaze and awe people, you would not have anything come from Galilee. Nothing come from Nazareth. But that's how God works. God is not amazed by the big and the fancy and the impressive. God is a God of the small and the unimpressive. Here's the angel Gabriel again. Remember, we met him last week. Two angels named in the Bible, Gabriel and and Michael, but hundreds of angels in the Bible. And Gabriel is always the one who brings good news. He appeared to Zechariah, and we remember Zechariah's response was, prove it. And God chastised Zechariah with silence until John would be born. We'll look at that in a week or two. But here, Gabriel visits a godly young woman. Can we just stop there a moment? We're going to spend two weeks on Mary. We know that our friends in the Catholic Church, if they make too much of her, we make too little of her. A godly young woman, a woman with a history with God. You want to have a history with God so that when God comes and knocks on the door of your life, you are ready. She's a virgin. She was sexually pure. And the angel comes and says to her, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Just stop there a moment. What does it mean to be favored by God? Let us not think for one moment it means Mary's going to have an easy life. Trace the life of Mary from this moment on, and whatever favor means, it does not mean easy. And for many of us, our goal in life is to have as carefree a life as we can possibly have, and then go to heaven if there happens to be one when we finally die a carefree death. That is not on offer by Jesus Christ. It's not on offer by God. Whatever favored meant, it did not mean easy. It meant, Mary, you are going to be a part of the salvation history of planet Earth through bearing the Son of God. And I want to say this. God has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of our lives, for he has favored us in Christ also, but do not confuse favor with easy. And let's settle it today that we want to be in God's will, but that does not mean an easy life. Too long the church in America has been poisoned by the prosperity gospel. 
every single one of us have gotten it in our heads that if I follow Jesus, life should basically be easier. Well, sin does make life hard. It really makes life hard when you have to lie and cover up and you wonder, you know, all the tragedies that sin brings. But following Jesus shapes us for heaven. And we need to get it into our understanding right now that God has not called us for ease, but for purpose. And listen to Gabriel's message to Mary. She was greatly troubled at this saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. Angels always have to say that to people. And he says four vital things. Number one, you will conceive in your womb and you will bear a son. Now, Mary has never been with a man. The mystery of the incarnation and the wonders of the virgin birth are vital and essential to our understanding of who Jesus is. God was incarnate in Christ, not in the normal manner. There was no normal procreation here. Now, when Zechariah and Elizabeth had a son, John, that was miraculous, but there was normal procreation. That didn't happen here. You will have a son. Number two, you will name him Jesus. Matthew tells us that the angel said to Joseph in a dream, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, Mary will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The word Jesus literally means Jehovah saves. Jesus came to save us from our sins. He didn't come just to give us some ideas. He didn't come fundamentally to teach. He didn't come fundamentally to heal. He came to save. And this is what Gabriel says to Mary. You shall have a son. You will call his name Jesus. And he will save his people from their sins. The third thing he says is he will be great and will be the son of the most high. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God. The exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe. By the word of his power, the son of the most high. That's a divine title. Gabriel comes to Mary, this godly young girl, and says, you will have a son. He will save their people from their sins. And he will be the son of God. And he will sit on the throne of David forever. And the Lord his God will give him the throne of his father David. This is a kingly and a messianic title. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 7. Of the increase of his government and of his peace there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom he will sit to establish and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forever. I became a happy follower of Jesus in 1975. How many of you were not born yet in 1975? Raise your hand. Okay. I was at college. I was 18 years old. I met Christians who really believed in Jesus for the first time. Now, I'd grown up in church. But going to church doesn't make you a Christian. I met real believers in Jesus. I met my wife there a real believer in Jesus. And one thing I was confronted with was this. You cannot be ho-hum about Jesus or the word ambivalent. This story and the four things the angel just said to Mary, Mary, you're a virgin who's going to have a son. Mary, he will be the savior of sinners. Mary, he will be the son of the most high God. And Mary, he will be the Messiah and King, and his reign will never end. Those four things 
are either the most profound truths imaginable, in which case they should totally re-circuit our lives every day, or they are the most profound lies ever pressed upon the human race, in which case we should close this church as fast as we can and stand against Christianity for all we're worth. What you cannot be about Jesus is ambivalent. You are either all in or all out. And one good thing that is going to happen in our generation is the church in our generation is going to be pruned because there are many of us who are just cultural Christians. And that must stop. These four things that the angel said to Mary are the most amazing things imaginable. So Mary comes with a question. And Mary said to the angel, verse 34, how can this be since I am a virgin? Now remember, Zechariah had a question too, but his question was with his chin jutted out. Prove it, God. Mary's question was humble. It's okay to ask God good questions, but it's not okay to question God's goodness. Ask him your questions. That's fine. God, how are you going to do this? Now, there are many, many pagan myths whereby a god comes down and has intercourse with a human and produces a divine child. There are many stories like that. Nothing like that was happening here whatsoever. Those are counterfeit stories and perversions. There's no evidence here of anything less than holiness. The story leaves us wondering and marveling. I'm going to be frank. Had this been a pagan story, there would have been some sort of sexual experience. But Mary says, Nothing's happened to me. I'm a virgin. This is holy and godly. Breathtaking and supernatural. And we are to wonder at it. Gabriel says God will overshadow you. This will cause the child to be born to be holy. Somehow the line of sin from Adam will be cut. This will be a holy child. Hate to say this, moms and dads, none of your kids are holy. <laughs> they need Jesus. They need redemption. We are born in the line of our forefather, Adam, with a sinful nature. This was cut off in Christ. The Holy Spirit will do this, Mary, and so this will be a holy child. And look at Mary's surrender. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Most High will overshadow you. And so this child will be the Son of God. And even your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son. She's in her sixth month. Verse 37. For nothing is impossible with God. The whole story is predicated upon that. Nothing's impossible with God. And look at Mary's response. Verse 38. Mary said, behold, I am the servant, literally the slave. The slave. The willing slave of the Lord. May it be to me according to your word. Let me ask this question. How godly can a young person be? The answer is very godly. This is a 15-year-old girl here. And she does not say what I was saying at 15. This is what I was saying at 15, and I wished I wasn't. What I was saying is, what about my life? What about what I want? 
What about my plans? What about my friends? What about my goals? Elizabeth Elliot said this, so much of what we call struggling is simply delayed obedience. So much of what we call struggling is simply delayed obedience. There is joy and freedom in Mary's surrender. And her words, which were vital to the redemptive purposes of God, right down to our knowing Christ, are also to be a template and a model for our hearts every day, every single day. You can pray the prayer that Mary answered Gabriel with. I'm the Lord's servant. Whatever you're going through, I am not here for my own purposes. I'm the Lord's servant. May it be according to your word. There's freedom in these words. Mary would have known Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Every follower of Jesus should memorize this verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. She would have known those words. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. What can your surrender and my surrender mean to God's greater purposes? What is your delay costing? Do we think we can do better with our lives than God can? What if Mary had said, well, actually, God, I have a better idea. There are two words you cannot say together. Think about this. You cannot say the words, no, Lord. Because as soon as you say no, he's not Lord. You can only say, yes, Lord. Settle it today. We're going to take communion in a few moments. The grand miracle, the amazing wonder of the incarnation should produce two things in us, faith and surrender. Faith and surrender. I have faith in Christ as my Savior, and I surrender to God's purpose in my life. So much of what we call struggling is just delayed obedience. I have to tell you a story of another young girl, Sophie Scholl. She's a new hero of mine. I don't know if we'll have a picture of her come up. There she is, Sophie Magdalena Scholl. She lived to the ripe old age of 22. She died in 1943. She was a Christian and an anti-Nazi political advocate along with her, fa- with, her hus- with her brother, Hans. Hans was a medical student at the University of Munich. She was a student at the University of Munich. They were imprisoned, convicted of high treason. And beheaded for distributing anti-Nazi literature. These were her final words. How can we expect righteousness to prevail when there is hardly anyone willing to give himself up individually for a righteous cause? Such a fine sunny day and I must go. But what does my death matter if through us thousands of people are awakened and stirred to action? Sophie was a Christian. She was a follower of Jesus. Her brother Hans had a profound and clear Christian conversion while at university in medical school. They died together on the same day. 
she also said these words, the real damage is done by those millions who just want to survive. Honest men who just want to be left in peace. Those who don't want their little lives disturbed by anything bigger than themselves. Those with no sides and no causes. Those who won't take measure of their own strength for fear it'll show their weaknesses. Those who don't like to make waves or enemies. Those for whom freedom, honor, truth, and principles are only in books. Those who live small die small. If you keep it small, you keep it under control. But if you don't make any noise, perhaps the bogeyman won't find you, but it's all an illusion because we all die. People who roll up their spirits into tiny little balls so as to stay safe. Safe? From what? Life is always on the edge of death. Narrow streets lead to the same place as wide avenues, and a little candle burns itself out just like a flaming torch. I choose my own way to burn, said Sophie. She was a kindred spirit to Mary. Sophie, who understood that Jesus was the Son of God, that Jesus was the Savior of sinners, that Jesus was the King, understood, I cannot seek safety and security in a world that is trying to destroy people. Be it done to me according to your will, Lord. Because I do this, I have seven books about Sophie. Thanks to Helen and the children's department. Seven people can get these. Moms and dads, I would ask you to get them and read them before you read them to your children. But if we don't know about people like this, our world will be infinitely impoverished. Knowing Jesus produces faith and surrender. I'd love to give seven of these books away this morning. They're beautiful. They're expensive. They're serious. It's not a Christian book. She was a Christian. This is a history book written from that aspect about her life. You cannot be ambivalent about Jesus. If he is the Savior of sinners, if he is the Son of God, if he is the King and Messiah, then nothing else can be the same. If he isn't, then we're cast into an empty universe with no hope. 